Hey kids, howdy, and welcome to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. That's me. Hey, Zoe. Good morning, good afternoon, evening, whenever people are listening. All the times, all the times. And we're we're coming at you for November 20th through the 26th. We are in the tail end of the Scorpio Mansion, about to, about to move over into Sag. So we're wrapping up the death and rebirth. We're going to switch over to Jupiter's rulership uh, uh, in a couple of days. Talk all about it, but let's start, like I like to do, with a quick question. Now, I think I actually answered Sue's email back at the end of October, but I kept the question in my little podcast question uh, list because it's a—it's definitely something I've been asked before, and it's, uh, let's clear this up. Great. So Suze writes to me, hoping this is a place to add a question for the podcast or for a quick answer. Following your encouragement to look for Libra and Taurus in my chart during the eclipse, it seems there is no mention of Libra in my chart. Can it be that we have signs that are absent from our chart? If so, what are the implications? Thanks, and thanks for everything. I practice my, and I love this. I had, <laughs> this is maybe why I'm reading this question on the air. I practice my daily plank pose during your Instagram red robe astrology videos uh, so that I apparently uh, I keep it. <laughs> um, delighted to be a part of your plank. And indeed, it's a good plank length. My average video is between 90 seconds and 125 minutes, 125 seconds. So a good like minute and a half, two minute plank. And what a great sure. question. I've actually never thought about this. So I'm really keen to hear the answer. Yeah, yeah. And this is not uncommon for somebody who's new to astrology to look at a chart because uh, they are sort of complex visually. And, and if there are no planets in the sign of Libra, it can happen that someone will be like, well, I don't have any Libra in my chart. So the, 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 the simple answer is no. It is not possible mm -hmm. to be missing one of the 12 signs. They're all going to be there, though a couple of distinctions. One is if you don't have any planets in the sign of Libra, there won't be a way that an aspect of your consciousness is driven by the lens of the Libra archetype. But you will absolutely have a house in your natal chart ruled by Libra. Hmm. 12 houses, 12 signs. When most people take their first breath, there's an even distribution of those 12 signs and the 12 houses, and one sign will rule each house in the chart. And this is, you know, there are a lot of chart visual styles that you might get online, like astro.com is one. And if you just go with their default visual style, you're going to see the glyph for Libra, not the word Libra or the, or the you know, you're, it's going to be hard to read. So you have to sort of picture the, the sign for any particular, well, the symbol for the sign and look for that in the chart. Some house of the 12 of the ho houses in your chart will be ruled by Libra. Now, there's another phenomenon in astrology called the intercepted house, where a polarity, that is two signs that oppose each other, might not rule a house in the chart, but will fall inside of a house. That's called an interception, and it implies that any of the energy of the planets in those signs, or if there are no planets in those signs, just the energy of the signs themselves, 
which we all contain everything, will be a little diminished in the first 40 years of a person's life. And then at midlife, there's a shift and those intercepted energies become like integrated more powerfully into someone's experience. And if you were looking at a chart where Libra and Aries were intercepted, you wouldn't look for that Libra glyph to be aligned with one of the lines that mark the 12 houses, but falling within the house that Libra falls into, like not on a line, but floating in the middle. That's a signal that you're intercepted. And it might be, Suze, that your Aries and Libra trajectory are intercepted. So when you look at the chart, you don't readily see Libra ruling a house, but it'll be falling inside of a house. Mm. So nobody loses any of the 12 signs. It's all in there for all of us, but there might be some ways you got to look a little carefully for it. So there are a couple of important things that are happening this week. It's a, it's a, I wouldn't call it a busy traffic heavy week, but there are some things that are happening. Notably, on Wednesday, we move into the Sagittarius mansion. We close out Scorpio. We put death and rebirth and change and transformation into our rear view mirror. And we move into a mansion ruled by Jupiter, the planet of expansion, abundance, and prosperity. The avatar of Sagittarius is actually a centaur, half horse, half human. So there's a divine quality that Sag brings uh, because it's a, it's a half a god, half, half, half human. And it allows our humanness to connect to our divine nature, right? When we interact with an archetype that is in both realms. He's also an archer, right? That's the avatar of Sag is the, the desire to shoot your arrows all over the place is the sort of behavior of Sag the archer. So if you put all of this together, Jupiter ruled half in the divine, half in the human realm, and this desire to stimulate all over the place, that's the essence of the Sagittarius mansion, the sign of Sagittarius. Jupiter ruled all about expansion. Everything in the direction of education and learning and spiritual seeking and traveling and going to other countries and learning about other cultures, all of those impulses to grow and expand were invented by Sagittarius. No, I, I was just thinking about how I tend to end relationships and be like, what is my future anyways? Always during Sagittarius season. We, I think we talked about it like a couple years ago. <laughs> so is that ago. like the post? Is that like a post cuffing <laughs> season? Like you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, I correction? I guess so. But I mean, I'm always like, it's always this question internally of like, what am I doing? I want to go somewhere. How am I going to? Well, do that? I will say it's this: very that you, what you're saying about Sagittarius not, season. Right. It's definitely a season where we are in consideration yeah. of what's the highest truth that we want to guide our lives with and through. I was thinking about this this morning, as I often do the day we record the podcast. I ruminate on things that might show up in what I have to say. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I will talk a lot about that in Western astrology in the Northern Hemisphere, so forgive me to the, our, my, our folks down under who have to sort of, through colonization, interpret the opposite of movement uh, because Australia is a colonized country that operates, you know, in an exact reverse to the relationship between Earth and Sun down under, right, where we're going into winter up here, they're going into summer down there. But Western astrology originated up here in the West, in Europe, from Mesopotamia, through Greece, through Rome, to Europe. And the, the signs follow our relationship to the sun, so that as the light is getting less and we move away from the, the, the harvest and the, the post-harvest of summer, and we start diminishing our relationship to the light, we have to prepare for the death that winter brings so that we can, in the spring, be renewed and reborn. So then 
Scorpio mansion comes along and we're all about that. The archetype of Scorpio directly reflects the lugubriousness and intensity of moving towards death. So then it's like, well, if if the light is getting even less and less as we move into Sag, not more because the nights are getting longer and the days are getting shorter, how would I then justify this arc of following the sun? Why would it be that after death and rebirth, we go into Sag, Jupiter's ruled mansion of expansion? And I had this quirky little sort of fantasy thought of after we're done with the the harvest of this, you know, the, the sort of planting in the spring and the harvest in the fall, and we get ready for winter and we've put our stores down and we're ready to feed ourselves. Then we get to like stop the hunting and the gathering, turn within and like, you know, play Sudoku and video games and sit around the campfire talking about the real housewives of the Serengeti. <laughs> <laughs> Right. The point being, in Sagittarius, we do put our outside world considerations behind us a little bit in a way, and then are free to explore the expansion that the archer sort of embodies. Now, I'm not being literal about this. I'm being sort of hopefully poetic. <laughs> that after marinating in what has to die successfully, you know, as we leave the sort of outward expression, we do that in Scorpio. And then in Sagittarius, we start the inner expansion, the spiritual trekking on the inner landscape that will lead us to the darkest day, the first day of the Capricorn mansion that is also the equinox. So as we enter the Sag mansion on Wednesday, be in some consideration of like what has died to be reborn. What did you get out of eclipse season and the, you know, the death that happens when we're in the Scorpio mansion so that you can think about like where you want to explore and expand over the next four weeks as the sun has our conscious awareness in the land of exploration. Two days later, Mars moves into the Sagittarius mansion and joins the sun in his trek through Jupiter's territory. Mars has been pretty close to the sun lately. If you remember last week, that rock'em sock'em new moon in Scorpio was conjunct the sun and they were both opposing Mars. So that as <laughs> Mars was uh, leaving Scorpio, uh, uh, we, we, we had quite a little bump of Mars opposing Uranus, creating sudden change and some pivots. I'm guessing last week some of you had, if nothing else, like what I had at the new moon, little just edgy moments of conflict showing up out of nowhere that I had to somehow navigate. So when Mars is in Scorpio, everything is more intense, especially in the world of our reactions and our angry reactivity that can be stimulated. We, we That gets a little deeper. And we're a little easier, breezier when Mars moves into the mutable fire mansion of Sagittarius. Technically, he's neutral here. He is neither you know amplified or diminished. So it's a neutral territory for him. But if you think about Mars as the planet of action and the sign of Sagittarius as being a sign of stimulation, there's actually quite a lovely harmony for how we experience our bodies, our relationship to decision-making when Mars moves into this territory we, where he can be easily stimulated and uh, um, that our physical experience is supported to explore lots of stuff. If there's a warning of the, you know, sort of six weeks or so of Mars in Sag is distraction, uh, getting too caught up with lots of details, being, um, you know, that, that's, that don't serve your need to be attentive to details in a, in a constructive way. I, I'm, reminded, I'm reminded of a boss I had back when I did, you know, work in the entertainment industry on the, on the business side of things where I had a boss. He used to get frustrated with me all the time because he would say to me, Michael, you're very good at the interesting, but not so good at the important. <laughs> and that's, uh, right? 
totally makes sense to me. I, yeah. I love the interesting yeah, and the important sense. is like, oh, <laughs> fuck. So that, that little, uh, that cutism is a good way of understanding Mars and Sagittarius will be very connected to the interesting and maybe a little less aligned with the important, but, you know, forewarned is forearmed. You might need an extra discipline added to your experience from a grit sort of place or a manufactured focus uh, between the 24th of November when Mars moves in here and then the 4th of January when he leaves. So for the rest of the year, we are more excitable, more interested in trying lots of different sort of things on our list. It's a good bucket list sign. You know, Mars and Sag says, let me get out there and have an experience of value. Um, and the only minor sort of like, and I won't even call this a warning, just a consideration that if Mars guides our decision-making and choices and how we focus on things, that's something that's very present during the next six weeks is going to be easy stimulation and a desire to get a lot done. But what might be harder to come by is slow, steady, steadfast, focused, discipline, and responsibility. This year and next year, there aren't a lot of what we call big triple transits in the cosmos, where some years there are. What that means is there are no big crashing major planetary transits that are guiding us in a way that, okay, I got to start again. While this year has been a little slim in the department of what we call triple transits, those sort of big sweeping transits from the social and or outer planets that will happen three times over usually a period of like 12 to 18 months that, that reflect big shifts and changes on the planet. We don't have a lot of those this year. Just as an example to contrast to that, you all remember 2020? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that was a wild year on the planet, and there were big transits being hit by Saturn and Pluto that, that appeared all year long that were like major, right? 2021, same thing. Uranus and, and uh, Pluto were square. I mean, Uranus and Saturn were squaring mightily that year. Now we're in years where the big energies are a little smaller in nature than, say, 21 and 20. 20. But one of the things that is true, I think, of astrology is, is that, that sometimes when the outside energies, if you will, are smaller, we vibrate more powerfully, like from the inside out, right? At any rate, there is a little triple transit that hits this weekend that's been part of the entire year that you may or may not have some identification with this. If you look back at the dates where this hit the first and the second time, we are wrapping up a semi-square between Saturn and Chiron. So the great teacher and the great healer have been in this mild conflict energy of the 45 degree semi-square all year long. Now, a semi-square is mild geometry, right? That's, it's a square is brutal, 90 degree, you know, big conflict and obstacle energy. And this is like half that. So it's mild. It's also not been a lot of other triple transits in this way this year to distract from this energy. And so let's, let's talk about what, what, we're, what might be being generated by this semi-square between the teacher and the healer. Well, first of all, we got to learn some things and heal some things. <laughs> like this, like both of them are up there saying to all of us collectively, you're not going to be able to meet life on life's terms in the way that's coming. And if you tuned in last week, you know that the next couple of years are rough with big change that could be difficult for us. And all of us are being called, I think, this year to do as much healing, thank you, Chiron, and growing into more wisdom, thank you, Saturn, as we possibly can. And so this transit hit in late February, mid-August, and now as a kind of thread of bumps in the road that might have 
brought up some themes of a demand to heal and a demand to learn. Saturn is always going to reflect our progress towards things that are important to us because Saturn is the planet through which we build stuff. So in this regard, I would call this a delay slash procrastination transit. And that if you've been with procrastination or delay challenges, I would invite you to re <laughs> reframe such things as divine timing in action. Okay. <laughs> Now, notwithstanding, procrastination is procrastination. And if you're not doing the shit that you've committed to wanting to, you know, to do to make things happen, you know, that ha that's a thing. People procrastinate and please, you know, don't. <laughs> My advice there. How to face procrastination. Stop procrastinating. Just there's, don't there's, do there's, it. There's my, my wisdom. Just don't do it. But I do invite you to look around your world and see if you can't reframe some of the what you might have called procrastination this year and just call it divine timing in action that we sometimes slow our own role because we're we don't maybe know this, you know, clearly in a conscious way, but we're actually adjusting our rhythm and our pace to meet life on life's terms. And this is for sure Z's a life on life's terms transit. So if you're feeling particularly sort of delayed or squeezed a little bit in terms of movement of things you are trying to accomplish, you might want to look back to February 23rd and August 14th and see if there's any thematic connection to those two timeframes because those are the dates this transit hit the first and the second time. And if you do notice something, understand that this is the third and final hit of this particular transit. While next year will bring us all kinds of stuff we have to grapple with, some measure of delay, lesson, wounding consciousness comes to a close as we move through this weekend. I'll say this, that I love the fact that this transit that kind of pushed us all into more responsibility and, and healing work this year, that I love that it comes as a kind of exclamation point after Venus is retrograde, after eclipse season ruled by Venus, and fully now in this Scorpio-driven lunar cycle where this week we move out of Scorpio into Sagittarius, really kind of putting the emphasis on change and transformation to bed. And as we move through this upcoming weekend, we're also putting to rest the calendar year's demand that all of us take some extra responsibility for our wisdom and allow for deep healings to take place. Huh. Well, kids, it is Mercury retrograde time once again. Like right now? This week? <laughs> well, the first act is starting right now. <sighs> yes. The retrograde backward motion doesn't happen until December. That process is December 13th through January 1st. It's actually like... January 1st or 2nd. So we're going to cross the, the threshold uh, into the new year with Mercury retrograde. So that backward motion doesn't happen until December. So you can think of December and January as the kind of bumpy months from retrogrades, from Mercury's actual backward motion. But the first act, what we call the retrograde shadow, starts this week on the 25th, Saturday. I jokingly refer to this part of any personal planet retrograde as the <laughs> brochure. <laughs> that you're, we're, we're being given information about what the, the dive is going to be that starts on December 13th, and we're being given that information from this Saturday on. So from Saturday, you want to be paying attention to any and every 
communication challenge that you bump into? One of the questions I get asked a lot out there, and I've probably been asked this and answered this on the podcast itself, is how do I keep track of dates? So people will write and they'll say, I notice frequently that you give dates to look back at. How would you recommend I keep track of things? And the answer is always, well, journal. And if you're not a journaler, you can create a kind of just energetic diary where each day you just describe things that are being felt by you or in, in the general energetic atmosphere as a way to keep track of things in order to look back. But here we are, we've got an opportunity to like invite you guys to do that specifically for a Mercury retrograde cycle. So if you've never done this before, grab yourself a little like journaly thing, start on Saturday, just clocking what's going on in your neck up experience every day, because there are a handful of triple transits that Mercury is going to move through from Saturday this weekend through December 13th, that he will repeat in the retrograde while moving backwards between December 13th and January 1st, and then repeat a third and final time after he goes direct on January 1st through the 20th or so of January in the third act. This is why when Mercury is retrograde starting in the middle of next month, I will occasionally in my Red Robe Astrology videos and or my Daily Astro Alert subscription series be saying to you, look back to blah, blah, blah date. Now you'll be ready. <laughs> so I invite you all to pick that up. There's actually some beautiful progress available during this Mercury retrograde cycle because of the triple transits that Mercury is going to be engaged in. Progress meaning Mercury is going to trine Jupiter, which is going to open our sense of confidence up so that we have a clear vision and the enthusiasm needed to say, I can make that vision happen. Sextile Saturn, that's productive and, and, and energy that can make things happen if you show up for the things you have to do. Now, the, the challenging geometry is the Seska square to Uranus is going to make this retrograde very retrograde. Like extra breakdowns? Uranus brings equipment failures and electronic challenges and digital shit. Uranus invented, the, you know, digital technology. <laughs> so uh, a Mercury in agitation to Uranus in a retrograde, yeah, you can count on this upcoming retrograde to be challenging in your like transport and digital world. And then a square from Mercury to Neptune is going to oh, add. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. You're learning enough to know that that's going to be challenging. And the, the challenge of Mercury in a square with Neptune is Mercury is all about communication and clarity. And Neptune turns on the fog machine when he's triggered with challenging geometry. This will mean more to y'all when we're when you know when we're in December and we do the podcast that talks about the backward motion. But uh, uh, this is the first time we've ever been at a moment since starting the podcast where it even occurred to me to speak out to you guys before the cycle starts and invite you to grab a pad, write some things down every day so that when Mercury turns around, you can make direct connections to things that might have come up in the weeks between this Saturday and December 13th when Mercury turns around. Did you know that Michael has a daily astro alert? If you enjoy hearing the weekly astrology, you might like knowing more about each day. When you subscribe for the daily astro alerts, you'll get an in-depth explanation of the day's astrology sent right to your email. Subscriptions are only $10 a month, or you can purchase the yearly subscription at the reduced price of $100. To subscribe, head over to michaelenix.com.
All right, it's dream segment time. Every week, Dr. Michael will interpret dreams that are sent in via email or take a live caller. If you would like your dream interpreted on the podcast, you can go ahead and email us at dreams at michaelenix.com. Hopefully your dream will make it onto the show. This week we have an email and dream from Megan. Um, And she gives us two different themes, but I'm just going to read the first theme. Megan says, hello, Dr. Michael Enzo. First, thank you so much for the energy and light that you bring to the planet. Your work brightens up my world and it's a gift to many. I have two different themes that I'd like to share with you. Maybe they're related to what I'm experiencing in life. The first dream I had involved cutting my hair. In the dream, someone who was a friend, and that's in quotes, (laughs) was cutting my hair. I do not remember who the person was, (laughs) but I know their vibe in the dream was in a friendship role. Ah, got it, got it. The person kept cutting my hair, and I was watching all the pieces fall to the ground. I became upset when I saw all the hair on the ground because I had just cut my hair at the salon and specifically asked for only a half inch to be cut off. I told the friend that I just had half an inch cut off and did not want it any shorter. The details I remember most are being upset by my hair being shorter than I wanted it to be and the visual images of the pieces of hair on the floor. A few weeks prior to this dream, I had a very similar one. I remember fewer details of that one, but the theme was very similar in that my hair was cut much shorter than I wanted it to be, and I was really upset about that short hair. So I just wanted to stick to that hair theme, but I did want you to know that um, her other her other sure, recurring sure, sure. theme involves children drowning in general. And then she gives us a little context at the end of her email. And she says, I'm wondering if these have any connections to my current life events. Considering that both dreams occurred more than once, I'm certain there must have a meaning that correlates with my waking life. I'm, there are many aspects of my life that are at a crossroads. My career is one aspect of my life that is changing but I feel it's manageable and I'm content with where I am. The area of my life that's most complicated is regarding my children. We've experienced some challenges over the past few years, and I believe my life journey is to be an advocate and a voice for them. My heart and gut are guiding me in one direction, but anytime I try to focus on the action steps, my mind gets frozen with fear and I'm paralyzed. In this area of my life, I feel stuck and trapped, even though my intuition is clearly guiding me. Thank you for taking the time and energy to read through my (laughs) dreams and help me process their meaning, Meg. Hmm. Oh, wow. First of all, I love all of that specific context. And of course, you know, the context always counts. That's sort of the beauty of working with our dreams is is that our dreams will reflect the underlying sort of places where we say no Mm. to life. So if the waking life experience that Megan is having is about moving into new territory in a risky kind of way, which it sounds like there's some risk there as she seeks to be in a more authentic expression, that our dreams reflect that because they help us go down below the surface of our awareness where we are either in fear or limit or lack or some kind of constriction. And I I think this is incredibly important. It's like you can't, like the manifestation teachers would just tell you, you can have anything you want. You just have to stay focused on what you desire and pretend that it's already in existence. And I don't mean to be mocking about that technique because that is how it works you do manifest by keeping you know an idea of what you want and filling yourself with the feeling of having it and using that as a as a tool of attracting and 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 you know receiving something that you desire 
But it ain't gonna work unless you're also spending some time in the places where we say no, where we're afraid, where change is overwhelming in some regard. And Megan's cutting of the hair has a lot to do with changing her role in the world. You know, we get very connected with our hair as part of our presentational self. Symbolically, then, hair connects greatly to feelings of attractiveness and the power that comes uh, when we're moving through the world confidently about how we'll be perceived by others. There's info that comes to us through First Nations folk where long, uncut hair was thought to be connected to a greater intuitive experience. In fact, remote viewers in World War II that were being brought from First Nations people into military places to use their intuitive gifts were then shorn of their hair and it diminished all of their intuition. That might be a bit of an urban myth, but it also means that our hair connects us to intuition. If we add the Judeo-Christian myth of Samson, then we have another way that the sort of attractiveness quotient of hair is also mythologically connected to strength and power. So that's just a handful of ways that hair is important. And if Megan is having her hair cut and the cutter is a friend, then we're going we're gonna to declare the cutting to be good. Now, like if, if, if it was an enemy cutting the hair, I'd be like, well. It'd be a different story. <laughs> then there's a quality we have to explore. But the fact that this was a friendship role, but not someone known to Megan, I think that's important. That is, um, it's a higher level character aspect by virtue of not being someone she knows. But archetypally, it's a helper. It's a friend guide. It's, it's, it's a part of her that knows that this is needed change is taking place. But change is scary and overwhelming. So watching the change happen and trying to navigate how short it can be cut, that's like Megan trying to control something that's out of her control. Being in regret and despair of the change that's going on by watching the hair fall to the floor, I think is reflecting how important it is to grieve the old things that are dying off in order for us to more fully rise up in ownership of that which is new. So the fact that she's engaged in her waking life in things that she wants to create anew, and that might change how she's perceived out in the world or how she chooses to show herself to the world, what a perfect symbol in a dream of that change. But the cutting of the hair. And if anybody with long hair has ever gotten their hair cut, they'll probably be able to report back that it can be an overwhelming experience in waking life to change your hair dramatically. And that speaks to how much we value our hair in our waking life as an important part of how we are seen and gotten by others. And that's all changing in Megan's experience. And the fact that she's orienting herself to work in the world that would serve children, I even think the other theme, even though we know very little bit about it, the drowning children in the dream is a little bit also of a death image such that something can be reborn in the area of how Megan sort of holds and contains the idea of innocence. Children represent innocence. Drowning represents emotional overwhelm. So just being someone who wants to do a certain kind of work in the world that advocates for children, who's having inner unconscious dream processes of helping her navigate the fears around those changes, that other dream theme might also be speaking to what has to sort of die and be reborn in Megan's experience in order for her to hold powerful space advocating for children who might be in some measure of waking life emotional challenges. And if I leave you with anything, Megan, it's just to repeat and reiterate the grief and despair 
of the hair falling on the floor is as important to be with as building the new psyche is. And the dream simply allowed you to go into a place where symbolism could get you connected to the emotional content of the grief of that which is being let go of so that you can move more powerfully into the next chapter with your new hairstyle rocking your new identity. (laughs) Have at it. Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaellennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily Astro Alert subscription, upcoming classes, and to join the mailing list.